joined with Norman Finkelstein, uh, leading scholar and author of a new book. In fact, he's written a new book called Gaza, uh, an inquiry into its martyrdom. How are you, uh, Norman? I'm fine. It's an inquest into its martyrdom. An inquest into its martyrdom. Thank you very much for the correction. Excellent. So um, I wanted to really just get your um, opinion, first and foremost, on what's really happening now uh, in terms of um, in terms of what's going on in in the Palestinian border. It's, it's really interesting because it's the first time you could say in quite a long time where Israel doesn't really have a pretense or a pretext for attacking uh, the civilians on the border. Uh, some some people say about 60 people have been killed, although there may be conservative um, uh, estimates. What, what's your take on all of this? Well, first of all, it's about 110 people who have been killed since March 30th, yeah. and about 12,000 who have been wounded, and many of the wounded have incurred life-changing injuries, which is to say permanent injuries. Mm. Injuries will never heal. Mm. Uh, Israel is using weapons, uh, which apparently inflict these kinds of uh, injuries that require amputations uh, and other sorts of injuries which will never heal. Mm. Um, my take is not, um, I think it's not novel at this point. First of all, I think it's important to attend to language that's not a border, uh, that's a prison gate, it's a concentration camp. Fence. It's a um, a ghetto fence, but it's not a border. Mm. A border at least suggests that there are sovereign states on either side of it, mm. but that's not the case. And um, mm. on the case of uh, in the for the Palestinians, uh, they've reached a do or die moment. Mm. The, the um, accumulation over literally seven, 70 years has now reached a point such that um, either they break out or they will have to slowly but surely die silently. Mm -hmm. uh, the process began 70 years ago uh, this month mm -hmm. with the mass expulsion of Palestinians from what became the state of Israel. Large numbers of them ended up in Gaza, were fled or were driven into Gaza. And uh, that expulsion was then compounded. Right now, about 70% of Gaza's population comprises refugees uh, and future gen and subsequent generations of refugees. Uh, in 1967, the expulsion was then compounded by the occupation of Gaza as well as the West Bank and East Jerusalem. And in the case of Gaza, it was an unusually brutal occupation. Uh, massive atrocities were carried out by Ariel Sharon in Gaza mm. in the late 1960s and early 70s. Then in 2016, the expulsion and the occupation were compounded by a brutal blockade that Israel imposed on Gaza, mm. uh, effectively denying it everything short of downright, outright um, starvation. Mm -hmm. So they were put on this minimalist caloric diet by Israel. Mm. And um, then that was compounded by Israel's periodic massacres that it visited on Gaza since 2004 and up until the Great March of Return on May 30th, March 30th, uh, Israel had inflicted uh, eight what they call as operations on Gaza, causing massive death and destruction. And so you have the expulsion, the occupation, the blockade, and the massacres, and each compounding the other, each exacerbating the other. 
Mm. And so at some point, it was not altogether surprising that the situation in Gaza would become literally unlivable. And beginning in 2012, the United mm. Nations started putting out reports yeah. asking the question, will Gaza be livable in 2020? Mm. And by 2017, Robert Piper, mm. uh, a senior UN humanitarian official responsible for the West Bank in Gaza, stated that Gaza had crossed the unlivability threshold a long time ago. And so Gaza is now a literally uninhabitable place and unlivable place. What does that actually mean if we were to actually kind of concretely define that? When we say something is unlivable, what do we actually mean by that? Well, let's take the most Mm. basic, essential, rudimentary Mm. um, index water, Mm. 97% of the water in Gaza is contaminated. 97, you said? Yes, so 97%. Mm. Well, Sarah Roy of Harvard University, the world's leading authority in Gaza, Mm. as she put it in the latest edition of her standard work, she said innocent innocent people, mostly young, are slowly being poisoned by the water they drink. That's not poetic language, and that's not hyperbole, and that's not embellishment. That's a literal fact. Mm. So the bottom line is you have 2 million people, half of whom, more than half of whom, are children under the age of 18. They are trapped by Israel in an unlivable space, and they're slowly being poisoned. And it was these this essential picture that eventually culminated in the Palestinian decision that either we do or we're going to die. And that's the great march of return. What do you think the solution is now? Because um, I think there have been different things that have been proposed in terms of what Palestinians in Gaza can actually do. Some of it has been uh, physical military solutions. Other, other things maybe that you've suggested in the past may have gone more down like a nonviolent kind of protest. Uh, now that we're seeing people try the nonviolent route and still being killed en masse, do you think, do you think it's still a good option? Um, it's very very premature to say, Mm. Um, and you can't undo a blockade that's been imposed for 11 years. It's a protracted struggle. The question is, in my opinion, the will of the people, the quality of the leadership, and the uh, ability of the people of Gaza to galvanize and mobilize international public opinion mm. to really bring pressure on Israel. Now, I don't think it's easy, and obviously the current occupant of the White House doesn't make it easier. Mm. Um, but first of all, I don't think they have any other options. And second of all, I think the past six weeks have significantly isolated Israel. Mm. If they can persist, and if they show real leadership, uh, if the leaders show real leadership, and it's not easy navigating these treacherous waters of the Gulf states of Egypt, of um, the Palestinian so-called authority. These are people who are ready to stab you in the back the moment you, you know, the moment you uh, leave yourself open to being stabbed in the back. So these are very treacherous waters to navigate. And Hamas has made many errors in judgment. Uh, And the fact of the matter is their most experienced levels of leadership have been wiped out by Israel. Israel is now contemplating, and it quite likely will, wipe out the current 
level, the current leadership, and then inevitably inexperienced people come into power and people who are hell-bent on vengeance, which of course they're entitled to, that's a normal human emotion. Mm. However, uh, you need experienced people and people who can demonstrate maximum discipline and self-control in order to navigate these treacherous waters. Um, so I can't predict. Mm. I know for certain they don't have any other option. Uh, the what's called armed resistance had not uh, produced any results. Everybody can agree the so-called diplomacy mm. is just a fig leaf for Israel's gradual annexation of the West Bank and its destruction of Gaza. So that's not an option. Mm. And then the third and only option that remains is nonviolent mass resistance. Mm. So if this fails, the people of Gaza will expire. Mm. Um, and so we have to invest everything we have in trying to make this work. Mm. I mean, it, when we think about kind of uh, Operation Cast Lead and uh, Protective Edge, 2008, 2014, respectively, I think the pretense has always been from Israel that it's been Hamas soldiers that have been armed and have been a trying attack and these things. And so they've had the right to self-defense. Here, obviously, there's, there's been this kind of mass protest, which has been non-violent by civilians, um, most of which, or all of which, are, not, are non-armed. Um, so the question really is, is Israel deliberately targeting civilian people? Well, Israel has always deliberately targeted civilians. Mm. Mm. That's, not a, uh, that's not a, it's not a question. Mm. Clear. The, 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 the difference is Israel was always able to use the Hamas quote-unquote rocket attacks mm. as pretext and as a facade mm. for targeting civilians. What makes this situation different is they don't have that pretext and facade anymore. Mm -hmm. And so even though the number of civilians killed in the past six weeks 110 is roughly the number that Israel killed on a typical morning during Operation Cast Lead and Operation Protective Edge. Mm -hmm. The outcry from the international community was much louder this time, even as the number of those killed was far fewer mm -hmm. because Israel couldn't use the pretext of self defense. Uh, from Hamas rocket attacks. And in fact, the past six weeks, Israel has been desperately trying to evoke those Hamas rocket attacks. That's why it killed the Hamas person in Malaysia. Then it killed six Hamas militants. Um, then it started to kill children and journalists plain, in plain sight, mm. hoping it would evoke enough rage and anger such that they would resume those rocket attacks. Israel is praying for them because that then gives them the pretext and the facade to go in and to commit mass death and destruction of the magnitude it inflicted, say, during Operation Protective Edge. Yeah. So why is the West being very acquiescent to this? I mean, why is the United States, for example, I mean, what can be, is it the Israeli lobby, or are we overestimating the power of the Israeli lobby? Look, there's a, a complete congruence of worldviews between mm. Mr. Trump and Mr. Netanyahu. Mm. They both hate foreigners, Mr. Trump, it's Mexicans and um, Muslims, Mr. Netanyahu, it's Africans and Muslims. They both like to build walls. They both like to strut across the world stage like mm -hmm. these macho dictators. Mm -hmm. they, they're, they're, uh, I don't think they have a intellectual or even a political worldview. These are both narcissists mm -hmm. who thrive on uh, they're basically showmen. They're 
uh, Mr. Netanyahu is a kind of P.T. Barnum of the Barnum Daily Circus. He's a kind of circus uh, character, a P.T. Barnum from hell. And Trump is, Trump is a kind of, he's a freakish character. But it's very hard to believe that he cares much about Iran or he cares much about anything except himself. I doubt he could even find, I think it would be, it would be very surprising if he could find Iran on a map. Uh, his map just consists of the locations of his hotels. That's his map. So, um, yeah. I don't think it has to read, one should read a grand geopolitical vision in all of this. Yeah. And the proof of my point is, if you take, for example, the agreement with Iran that was just torn up by Trump yeah. with encouragement of Mr. Netanyahu, in both cases, in the case of Trump and Netanyahu, all of their respective senior military and security advisors told them, don't do it. It's a very good deal. Mm. You know, even Mathis, the Secretary mm. of Defense, he said, don't mm. do it. All of Israel's security and military people said, don't do it. It's mm. a very good deal. Mm. And then you have to ask yourself, and why did they do it? You can't convince me that Trump has greater geopolitical insight than all the members of the military and security establishment in the U.S. who embraced, endorsed the deal, and ditto for Netanyahu. And then the answer, it's not a particularly comforting answer, especially for those who like it to deal with, the big picture of geopolitics and the great uh, forces at work in human history, it's a little bit painful to have to swallow the fact that a lot of what's going on now is due to two uh, profoundly, really pathologically, narcissistic characters mm. uh, who are not in all respects, for example, the determination to crush Gaza is a, um, it's a, uh, an undertaking that's shared by most, not all, of the Israeli political establishment. There are some in the Israeli military political establishment who have called for allowing Gaza to rehabilitate. So it's not uniform. But on, in, in large areas, you can't even talk about Israel or the United States. It's really one, in each case, a demented individual who happens to be the head of state. Mm -hmm. um, so you, think you could be over-exaggerating the power of the head of state there, because obviously in the American context, you've got, you know, checks and balances, separation of powers, you've got different interests being represented. Is, is it just one man? Could we just reduce it to that? In some cases, the executive mm. is a very powerful office, mm. and now you have a very idiosyncratic, eccentric, uh, positively weird mm. person who's occupying the, the highest seat of power, and there's just no getting around the fact that that single individual wields a lot of power. Now, in the case of Iran, it's true, his two recent appointees, Pompeo and Bolton, both talked about shredding the agreement, but that wasn't the opinion of his previous appointees. So even if it's three who share this opinion, it's still not really representative. On the case of Gaza, I would say it's more representative because they're basically untermenschen, they're subhumans, mm -hmm. and the great scheme of things, they don't count. Because as people like uh, Netanyahu and uh, Trump strut across the world stage, they only, for them, the only thing that counts is people with power. Yeah. They're imitations of Modi in India, 
-hmm. of Erdogan in Turkey, mm -hmm. of um, Putin in Russia, of the fellow's name just slips my mind in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. These are just um, thugs who are in power. That's right. And it's a, it's a scary phenomenon for mm -hmm. sure, mm -hmm. these thugs. Um, on the other hand, mm -hmm. I'm not so convinced that at the end of the day, they're going to prevail. They're having their moment in the sun right now. Yeah. But the expression, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Mm. And what goes round comes round. We're right now at the mission accomplished stage yeah. of uh, George Bush's attack on Iraq. We're at mission accomplished stage. Mm. As we already know, there are many stages that come after mission accomplished. And I'm not convinced that these people are going to fall very hard. Right. Just for the sake of making the argument now, going back to kind of the crimes that are being committed against the Gazans, I wanted to ask you specifically, how does, for example, in international law, for example, how, is, how are war crimes defined? And how is Israel actually uh, committing war crimes in, the, in these cases? Well, there are two ways to approach it. Mm -hmm. One is to go through the uh, applicable international law and then to make a judgment about whether Israel is guilty of having committed war crimes, crimes against humanity, and so forth. Mm -hmm. The other way to approach it is to just clear away all the legal jargon mm -hmm. and to make a... Um, Make a, to render a judgment based on one's common sense. Right. The common sense asks you, does Israel have the right to poison one million children? Mm. Mm. If you don't think it has that right, then it has no right to use any force. This kind of debate about whether Israel is using disproportionate force as if it's allowed to use proportionate force that Israel is using excessive force as if it's allowed to use moderate force. Mm. The question of whether Israel is applying what's called the international humanitarian law, the laws of war, mm. when it should be applying the international human rights law, it seems to me all of these questions are academic to the point of being obscene. How, would, how could anyone, let's take a simple example. If Auschwitz, mm. if Auschwitz concentration camp abutted the German border, was right on the German border, and the people in Auschwitz organized to non-violently break the border, okay? Breach the border mm. with Germany. Would anyone back there have even posed the question what degree of force Germany or the Nazis are allowed to deploy to prevent them from breaching a concentration camp in which they're slowly being poisoned? Mm -hmm. Would that question even arise? Mm -hmm. Would it even be a question that any sane person would ponder mm. there's a kind of complete mm. insanity mm. when i read in the bbc or i read in the pages of Horitz, or i read all of these lawyers debating what degree of force is israel allowed to use mm. does a rapist have a right to self-defense if the victim resists by scratching him. Does a rapist have a right to self-defense? Mm. Is that something so Gandhi said? How can you claim mm. that Israel has any right, right. to use force mm. against an overwhelmingly non-violent population mm. that's trying to breach mm. an unlivable space in which they're slowly being poisoned. I personally find obscene mm. the kinds of debates I see going on 
about what is the relevant body of law and what is the standard of force Israel has to abide by. It has no right to use any force any more than people trying to break out of Auschwitz have to apply a certain level of force before they're accepted by the international community. Everyone's saying now, the people of Gaza have to be more nonviolent. Really? That's the problem? They have to be more nonviolent? Would anyone have dared to say that to the inmates of Auschwitz? If you're going to break out, you really have to lower the threshold of violence. Mm. It's so completely insane, the kind of debate that unfolds now in the papers, the media of this so-called Western civilization. It's very painful to behold. Well, I mean, you made the comparison between kind of Auschwitz um, and what's going on now in, in, in Palestine. It's a concentration camp in which in yeah. Auschwitz, the death was at a more accelerated pace. In the case of Gaza, it's at a slower pace. Is that a significant difference? Mm. Is that a significant moral difference? You want me to say the pace was faster at Auschwitz because they sent 10,000 people into gas chambers a week? Yes, it was faster. You want to tell me the magnitude, the numerical magnitude is greater? Yes, I will agree, uh, agree to that. Is that really so consoling? Does that console your heart to know that the one million children in Gaza are being poisoned at a slower rate? No. Yeah, that's a good, it's it's yeah. unspeakable what's going on now, and we yeah. shouldn't play these verbal games. Right, right. No, I mean, uh, do you reckon that there, there could even be a parallel between uh, kind of what you would see as a Zionist ideology and... and not I even... don't care about Zionist ideology. Mm. Let's not drag in extraneous factors or extraneous issue, issues. Mm. Israel is a crazy state. It's a completely lunatic state. In fact, most of the founding Zionists if they came back and they saw that Netanyahu was the head of their state, I'm sure a lot of them would have wondered whether it was worth it. Mm. So I don't think it's a question of Zionism. Mm. And I wish people would just drop that. Mm. I wrote my doctoral dissertation on Zionism. Mm. I know a lot about Zionism, but I never invoke it nowadays because it's completely irrelevant. It's not Zionism. It's a state that's gone mad. It's a racist, Jewish supremacist, obnoxious, self-righteous, morally corrupt state that has very little to do with Zionism. Norman Finkelstein, thank you very much for your interview and thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. You're welcome.